Hello and welcome to Reaching for the Moon, presented by Everglades Moon Local Council, Florida Chapter of Covenant of the Goddess. COG supports individual works by its covens, members, and local councils. It's a vibrant network of a myriad of Wiccan and witchy resources, religious support, friendships, service opportunities, and more. To find out more, visit our website, emlc.net, our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Everglades Moon, or Twitter, at EMLC Tweets. Hello everyone, this is Lady Bridget, and welcome to episode 33 for Litha, Litha, or Midsummer. However you pronounce it, or ever you celebrate it, it is the summer solstice. We're going to start out with Pandy's Pagan Projects. She's going to teach us how to make sun's eyes. And I believe she's going to put either some pictures or the video on the show notes to give you an idea in case you're not able to visualize exactly what she's talking about. Then we're going to follow that up with Fudu with Cabal. And he's talking about something that sounds incredibly yummy, cookie butter. After that, we're going to have a song by the Crow Women from their album Crow Goddess called Away Ye Merry Lasses. And this is one of the really cute songs. I love this one. And you can learn all about Crow Women and buy their music at CD Baby. After that, I'm going to steal Riken's segment, It'll Grow On You. I'm going to use his segment for a workshop that I gave at Equinox in the Oaks last year called Cooking with the Land. And the reason I think it's appropriate is because it's litha and there's a lot of vegetables that are all of a sudden becoming available in most parts of the world. Not so much where we live here in South Florida, but in other parts of the United States, in the Northern Hemisphere anyway, um, things are coming to flower and fruit. And it's a good time to learn about cooking with the land, about buying locally grown vegetables, about what to do with them and how to compost them afterwards. And so that's what that segment is about. We will end the podcast with a song called Wave by Ginger Doss from her album Hand and Hammer. You can learn more about Ginger Doss and purchase her music at gingerdoss.com. So everyone, I hope you enjoy and I hope you have a wonderful and blessed summer solstice. everyone. This is Alpandia, and it's time for another one of Pandy's Pagan Projects. With summer solstice just around the corner, now is a great time to get in some sunny crafting. If you've ever made a god's eye before, you'll be using those techniques to make our wonderful sun's eye. To make this project, you will need four long sticks. These can be craft sticks from the craft store or thin long twigs that you found in your yard. If you're here in Florida, you could maybe also use long, stiff palm fronds. I think those would work really nicely, too. Just make sure to shake them out so you don't have any stragglers from out in the dirt. You'll also need weaving material, such as sunny-colored yarns, strips of fabric, ribbon, and twine. Um, Some optional options may be uh, bells, shells, beads, feathers, or anything else you'd like to weave into your sun. You can also plan to have some streamer ribbons with things attached to the end to make your sun flutter and flutter in the breeze. And you may also want to have a hot glue gun handy to make getting started just a little bit easier. We're essentially making a god's eye, but with eight spokes instead of four. So let's get started. First, hold your sticks so you have all four crisscrossing at a central point. This is where we'll start weaving. The length of your sticks from that central point will dictate how big or small your sun will be. So if you're not happy with the size, now would be a good time to find some larger sticks. Once you have the sticks crisscrossed, you can use your hot glue gun to secure them in place. If you don't want to use a hot glue gun, you'll start by diagonally wrapping your first color of yarn across each set of the sticks, making X's. You'll want to secure them a few times each so that they stay spread out like spokes in a wheel and stay together. 
Now hold your bundle of secured sticks together and we're going to start to weave. We'll be doing essentially the same thing the whole way around. You'll wrap the yarn over and around one stick, give your bundle a turn, then wrap your yarn the same way over and around the next stick. Pull the yarn tightly each time and make sure each new row of yarn is lining up right next to the previous ones. But don't pull too tight because you'll start to make your stick skew and then your sun might get a little weird shaped, which is cool if that's what you're after, but if you're kind of like me and need it to be equal, it's something to be mindful of. You can switch colors at any time or even switch your materials at any time to get some amazing effects. Just tie off the previous piece to your sticks and not on a new one. You'll be able to use different yarns and different colors and different materials. Maybe some will be shimmery, maybe some will be flatter colors, and your sun is going to look amazing. If you have beads or charms, you'll may want to string them on as you go uh, so that they can be part of your design. Though this can sometimes be a little hard if you're working off of a spool of yarn that's on a big skein. So another option would be to whip stitch those items in later using a sewing needle and some of your leftover yarn. When you've gotten to the end of your sticks or you feel your sun is big enough, tie off the last bit with a good loop and a double knot to secure it so that you have a way to hang it. Now you can add any other decorations you may want, including those previously mentioned bells and charms. Um, I've seen some really pretty ones with streamers attached to the bottom edges so that they'll flutter in the breeze, as I said before, or with crystals dangling off some of the spokes that catch the midday sun and spread rainbows all over the place. Now that you've made your first sun's eye, you can use this technique to make any sort of different shapes or color patterns. Why not try rainbows or even do shades of a color to hang in your elemental quarters? The possibilities really are endless. I can't wait to see all of your wonderful suns. Be sure to share them at our website, emlc.net, or on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Moon. Have a sunshiny day! Welcome to Fudu. Happy Midsupper. No, not Midsupper. Happy Midsummer. When in South Florida, it's not just hot, it's Africa hot. Well, it might actually really be hotter than that because I've been in Africa and it hasn't been this hot. And it's been raining so much that if I had any sense, I'd be dictating from an arc. Anyway, it's so hot and humid that the last thing we want to do in summer is actually cook. But there's good news. Summer also brings us a tremendous abundance of fruits and berries that are widely available, and we can do so many things with them, like just eat them like they are. No cooking at all. We don't have to turn anything on. It doesn't have to get hot. And there are so many other things that you can do with them if you wanted to cook that the list is endless, which is good because we're done talking about them. Let's talk about cookie butter. The other day in one of our online chats, a witchkin put up a picture of a commercially available cookie butter and asked, is this good? And the answer was, oh, but yes, you want to smear it on you and lick it off. And then Raven asked, I wish it were available in Oreo, which it's not. But Raven, this is for you. Cookie butter is amazingly easy to do and requires basically no cooking or the need to pay ridiculous amounts of money for it. You don't have to process it. There's al The only thing you have to do is mix it. The cooking that needs to happen is melting some butter, which in Florida means that you put a pot in the sun for 30 minutes, then room temperature butter, a.k.a. near-melted butter, in the pot and wait three minutes. But you can stove top it if you'd like. So here's what you need. Two cups of cookies. Seriously, try the Oreos. But any dry cookie will work. The Oreos are what you want. Half a stick of butter, a quarter cup of evaporated milk, 
half a cup of sweetened condensed milk. We'll also need a food processor or a multi-bladed blender or a real desire to pulverize cookies with a mallet and a zip bag. So step one, pulverize the cookies. Step two, melt the butter and mix in the evaporated milk and the sweetened condensed milk. Stir it until it's well blended, all the stuff together, and we'll just call this mix the liquid yum. Now, add about half a cup of liquid yum to the pulverized cookies and stir. Then keep adding a little bit more until you get the consistency of peanut butter. You're done. Now refrigerate it for 30 minutes, and you're ready. it's ready to eat. If you have any leftover liquid yum, or you can also just use water for this. You can add more to make it a more liquidy treat that you can drizzle over ice cream or dip stuff into like apples or pretzels or just pour into your mouth or on another person, saving the spoon cleanup so you have less work in the summer. Cookie butter ultimately keeps for about a couple of weeks in the fridge. It will keep at room temperature if you live in Norway, but cookie butter won't probably last that long. By the way, you can also add essences into the cookie butter to make it slightly different in flavor. For example, adding orange rind or extract to the Oreos or some lemon extract to the sugar cookies. Whatever lets you live on your witchy edge. So enjoy and have a great litha. They told me mama was going out. She asked what I was all about. I asked if I could take the broom. I'm going to meet the girls. Oh, the moon is waxed tonight. And don't you like the fellas? I prefer the girls tonight. I'm going to ride the wind because it's the girls' night out. Away you merry lasses. Get your brooms. Get them out. We'll ride the winds tonight. Oh, it's the girls' night out. Away you merry lasses. Get your brooms. Get them out. We'll ride the winds tonight. My sister is so bold and free. She asked if she could come with me. I saw her up above the trees. I'm going to ride the wind. Oh, the moon is waxed tonight. And don't you like the fellas? I prefer the girls tonight. I'm going to ride the wind. Cause it's the girls' night out. Away, you merry lasses. Get your brooms. Get them out. We'll ride the winds tonight, oh, it's the girls' night out. Away, you merry lasses, get your brooms, get them out. We'll ride the winds tonight. As we were going out the gate, we met our dear old mother, riding a broom and humming a tune and going to ride the wind. Oh, the moon is waxed tonight, and don't you like the fellas? I prefer the girls tonight, I'm going to ride the wind, cause it's the girls' night out. Away you merry lasses, get your brooms, get them out. We'll ride the winds tonight, oh it's the girls' night out. Away you merry lasses, get your brooms, get them out. We'll ride the winds tonight. I don't have any degrees that would give me expertise in any of these areas, but I have a lot of experience. To me, getting with the land is all about like, getting your hands dirty, getting your feet dirty, practical use, and being a Virgo with like multiple planets in Virgo. Um, I do a lot of cooking. I like to cook. I like food preparation. But I also live with Lord Riken, who is, uh, has a degree in forestry. And he has... Um, Capricorn moon. So I don't know if you know anything about astrology, but Capricorn moon means the man likes to reuse, recycle, redo, and he can't throw anything away. <laughs> Ever. Because <laughs> it's all useful. Because it might be a useful one. Yes, absolutely. Either from him or somebody else. <clears throat> so basically, after living this, living with him for this many years, 20 years or so, we have developed this system. And I thought, you know, this would be pretty cool to share. So that's what I'm doing. And kind of starts with the veggies. 
So when we go shopping for vegetables, we're shopping for local, locally grown vegetables. So we're going to small farmer's markets. We're looking for little veggie stands on the side. Um, and it means buying vegetables when they're in season, not when they're imported. A lot of the vegetables that are imported are never ripened on the vine. They're ripened by gas in a truck. So if you're eating a tomato and, you know, it's from someplace else, you're eating a tomato that was ripened by pumping nitrogen gas into a truck. And that's how they ripen them. Like as, as, they're being transported. as they're being transported, exactly. And my sister and brother-in-law are truck drivers, so mm -hmm. <laughs> they've actually done some of this, you know, transporting fruit and stuff in a truck that's been gassed. It's not the healthiest way to eat, i got to say. You're much better off finding locally grown produce. Now, this means that you're not going to have tomatoes all year round. We've gotten so spoiled because it's like, oh, I feel like having a salad. I'm going to pop down the Publix or the shopper, you know, supermarket, and I'm just going to buy, you know, all my salad stuff without thinking, wow, well, you know, the tomatoes came from Chile and the lettuce is from California and this is from here. And it's just, you know, you're not buying what being grown locally. And in Florida, there's really not a whole lot of excuse for that because there's only a few months, granted, they're the summer months, when stuff really doesn't grow much down here. But, you know, with a little planning, you can what, definitely... What part of Florida are you in? South Florida. Okay. So in South Florida, we're in climate zone uh, 10A, 10B, and 9A and B. We're subtropical. Come the end of May, June, yeah, by Litha, everything's fried. And the sun is too intense, the heat is too intense, it just doesn't really grow. Now, if you bring it indoors and you have like an indoor setup, you know, you can get away with that. And there's some things that he's managed to grow in these little earth pots um, that he'll manage to keep all year round, but they, they're kind of pathetic and straggly, and you can't really harvest off them while they're basically trying to survive. So we usually harvest everything by Litha, and then we start planting again at Salon, and that's how our, our setup ends up being. Now, also, if you can find a co-op in your area, right, where they'll have vegetables, and they'll deliver like a box of vegetables a week. But you might get five eggplants. And you're going to look at this and go, and I'll tell you why I'm, I'm using this as an example. You're going to look at this and go, the hell am I going to do with five eggplants? <laughs> and I personally don't even like eggplant parmesan. <laughs> it must be the only vegetarian on the planet who pours <laughs> eggplant parmesan. I went to a local market, and I went to a farmer's market, and they, had, they were selling out the eggplant because they had them five for a dollar. I can't resist five for a dollar. I'm sorry. And the little muck, they were this, they were huge. Okay, they look like footballs. So I get them home, and I'm like, oh my god, what the hell am I going to do with five eggplants? Because it didn't occur to me when I was buying them. I was like, wow, look at all the money I'm saving on my food budget. Then I get home, and I'm like, the hell am I going to do with these things? <laughs> the internet is your best <laughs> best friend. You could Google anything. I found five different recipes for eggplant. None of them were Parmesan. None of them had the same flavor profile. So I, we had eggplant every night for the rest of the week, and we were eating a completely different meal every single night. I got no complaints, and that was rare in those days, because that was when I was raising my teenagers, and they were very food picky. Not so much now, because they're cooking for themselves. So the thing is, if you're buying locally and you're looking on the internet and you're finding a lot of fruits and vegetables and you're buying them in season, you're going to have extra. I don't do canning at this point, but I may. I may start that because we got a new pressure cooker and I'm kind of having fun with it. So that's one of the things you can also do. A lot of times also you can cook vegetables ahead of time and freeze them. Tomatoes is a great example of that because you can make them into tomato sauce. So there's a lot of things that you can do. And um, talk to your parents and grandparents because guess what? That's what they used to do. Because we didn't have good refrigeration. We didn't have the ability to fly vegetables. It just wasn't cost efficient, you know, to fly food all over the place. And in their day, this is what they did. And, you know, everybody lived and they lived quite well and they ate quite well too. Because the other thing is if, if you have it all the time at your fingertips, it's no longer a treat. It's no longer special. I mean, when was the last time you bit into a beautiful, luscious strawberry and really appreciated that strawberry? Because you can get it all the time. So it's like, oh, today I think I'll have strawberries. It's not really a treat. And I think part of that might be lending itself to the obesity epidemic also mm -hmm. because it, we're just way, way too indulgent. But I won't get off on that <laughs> tangent. 
The other thing you want to look at is, is spicing because there are so many different spices that, and, and I have the spice rack to prove it. Um, I have like 75 spices in alphabetical order on my wall. And that's not including all the, all the blends that are in the cabinet. I know. Yeah. <laughs> you've seen the pictures. I yeah, it. you've seen them. I know. They have to be alphabetical or I couldn't find one. You know, I'd be spending all my time looking for the cumin in that. <laughs> And, and, you know, if Riken puts him back out of order, he gets slapped. <laughs> he gets his hand slapped. Don't touch it if you can't put it back. But you can use a lot of different spices to make different flavor profiles. So there's, like, to name a few, there's Indian, there's Asian, there's Thai, there's Mexican, there's Moroccan. Use the Internet. And you can make these ones up ahead of time, stick them in a little jar. You know, we use a jelly jar or something. Label it. And then you've got it. It's a it's a vegetable rub. It's a meat rub. You can throw it in the um, water when you're making rice or couscous. And if you add the same spice flavor profile to your meal, everything blends well together. And even if you're not doing anything more exotic than like chicken breast and rice and some veggies, if you add a spice blend to all of that and use the rub on the on the chicken when you put it in the George Foreman grill or whatever you do with it, because I don't really fry anything either you're going to have the flavors all going to blend together. So you're not going to have this jarring taste. You bite into one vegetable and it has cheesy flavor, and then you bite into something else and it's got Thai flavor. And you're like, ah, wait, there's a war going on in your mouth. It blends everything nicely together. And I find when you buy pre-mixed frozen vegetables and pre-mixed frozen blends and all this stuff that's supposed to be so convenient now, and it may be convenient, but it's so full of salt and it's so full of preservatives. And it's just... So bad for you. Your body doesn't know what to do with that stuff. It's overkill. The closer you are to the original food source, the more healthy you're eating and the better off you are. Now, okay, we've chopped up our vegetables, we've cooked them all, we've put in our flavoring spices, and you've got all these ends. Okay, you've got the carrot tops, you've got the ends of the snap peas, maybe you had edamame and you've got the shells. There's the cauliflower greens, there's tomato tops. Some of the lettuce might have been a little wilted, so you pulled it to the side. And most people, unfortunately, probably a huge percentage of people in this country would just throw them in the trash. They're not done yet. Those veggies are not done yet. Reuse, recycle, redo. Take those veggies. Now, you don't want to use the starchy ones, but for the regular vegetables that are not too mucinous and not too starchy, you can put them in a bag and stick them in the freezer. So you've got all these ends. Now, the reason I t say put them in the freezer is because you can't use them once they get brown because that's going to ruin your broth. You're going to make veggie broth out of these. This is what I do. We don't often have enough of the ends of the vegetables to make a decent amount of broth. I pop them in a bag, a little plastic green bag or something, and stick them in the freezer. And the reason you can do that is because you don't really care if it breaks down the cellular structure because you're going to do that when you cook it anyway. So it's fine. Take your carrot tops, take your celery, take all of those vegetables, the insides of the peppers and all that stuff, just stick them in the bag, and when you got a nice hefty bit, then you're going to make broth out of it. You said not the starchy ones, so right. like not potato skins? Not potato skins, not um, cucumber skins, anything that's too starchy or too mucinous, because if you put that in the broth, you're going to get too mm -hmm. much starchy, or, too, or you're going to get jelly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. gonna, it's not going to be good. And, and you can ask me how I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Trial yeah. and error on that. Yeah, exactly. And um, also, when I, if I boil some kind of stuff, if I boil things for anything, I save the water too, which it may be a little over the top, but I'll put it in a jar and I'll label it veggie water and I'll stick it in the fridge. And I'll do this mostly the week or two before I know I'm going to make broth. So I'm looking in the freezer and I see my bag's getting a little full and I'm like, okay, well, you know... I think I've got a free afternoon, Saturday or Sunday. I think I'm going to make broth. So I'll go, okay, and I'll, I'll start saving some of that veggie water, too. Because then you're not starting from scratch. But don't throw the veggie water down the sink. Even if you're not going to save it, go put it outside feed it to you. Because it's got all these nutrients in it that got boiled off the veggies. And your plants will use it again. Mm. Pouring it down the sink, where's it going? Into the trash. Mm. So go out and water your plants with it. They'll love it. Let it cool off first, though. They won't love you if it's still there. <laughs> yeah, I say that because I have to. <laughs> so you can save that veggie water. You can put those veggie pilings, scrapings, whatever, you know, into the freezer. Then you take them out, and now you're going to put them in a pot. Now, if you have a pressure cooker, do you have it? Who here has a pressure cooker? Okay. I highly, highly recommend it. 
because they are awesome things, especially the new ones. No, really. I was raised in one of those families where everybody was afraid of pressure cookers because somebody had had seen one blow up once. So I understand I need to get with the times that they improved. And I still have my grandmother's pressure cooker, and Riken still has his mother's pressure cooker. Yeah, they're one. Can you buy them once in your lifetime? They should last the rest of your life. Yeah, you just need to replace the gasket, and we have them, and we won't give them up because he's convinced you know the zombie apocalypse is coming or something. Mm -hmm. He's a survivalist, so we don't really give them up because he can't you know give anything up but <laughs> someday we'll find a use for those but in the meantime they're kind of in the garage in the attic or something but the pressure cooker is one of your best friends because it will cook everything for you it'll cook down beans it'll cook down all kinds of stuff if you put the veggies in the pressure cooker put in your veggie water or you can use distilled water i like distilled water because the ph is exactly right for your bodies to get rid of toxins that's probably a different workshop if you have to just use tap water if you use rainwater, make sure it didn't come off your dirty roof. That's what I use for watering the plants, not not I don't use tap water for hardly anything. So we'll put the water in just to cover, because you don't want too much water. In the pressure cooker, the water's not going to evaporate. Okay? You're gonna put it out for fifteen minutes, you know, let it jiggle or whatever, put it out for fifteen minutes, wait till it cools down enough to take the cover off and check it. Does it look dark enough? If it doesn't look dark enough, throw it out another 15 minutes. Now, into that, you can also add chives, whole peppercorns, uh, basil, bay leaves, any other fresh herbs you want to add. You can even add a little bit of Mrs. Dash. I used to add like a teaspoonful of Mrs. Dash just into that, just to give it some more body. Because not all the vegetables are going to have as much body as you want. And you we're put spoiled. the basil in things before you cook it? Hmm? You put in the basil and scotch before Yep. Okay. I put it all in there, and then I let it let it cook down. Now, I didn't used to use a pressure cooker. I used to just use a big pan. And if you use a big pan, then you're going to use two cups of water for one cup of veggies. You're going to use about twice as much water as you expect to have at the end. So you're going to put it on to boil, and you're just going to let it boil. You know, keep an eye on it, which is like why I like the pressure cooker, because I don't have to watch it. I can go off and do something else, and it'll just beep at me when it's done. But if you're using a pan, it used to take me oh, probably two, three, four hours, depending on how much water I'd have. And you just kind of let the water boil. And then you put it on low, or put it on simmer, and just keep an eye on it and let the water boil down. When you've got about half as much water as you started with, that's when you've got pretty good broth. And you can check, check your coloring and stuff. So take the veggies out, squeeze them. You know, get a couple of uh, slotted spoons or something and squeeze those puppies for all their work. Because you want to get every good drop out of it then you can go in the compost bucket. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. <laughs> so then after you've squeezed all the water out and you've got your veggie broth, put it in little containers. You can use like the little one cup containers. Um, you're definitely going to want to mark it. I don't know if your freezer looks like mine, but there's a lot of mystery stuff in there. Because <laughs> my husband doesn't believe in marking any of his science experiments. <laughs> he has his own fridge now. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> but um, I just use masking tape. So, you know, you don't have to go out and buy fancy, you can if you want to, you know. But masking tape works great. Masking tape and a, and a Sharpie, you know, you just put on it broth. And then I date them because I like to rotate the stock. So I date them. And I will make somewhere between 8 and 12 cups of broth at a time. And that's great. Now, the only other thing I want to say about if you're going to use onion... Yeah, I was just going to ask you about onion skins. Yeah, I don't use the skins. You can, mm-hmm. but I don't use the skins. But sometimes, you know, you got to chop the top off of it yeah. or something, you know. If you're going to use onion in your veggie broth, I strongly recommend that you label it. Because if you use onion veggie broth to make cucumber soup, it kind of doesn't work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I did that. So there's stuff that I won't use onion for. And I, you know, because I make a lot of different stuff. And so if you do have onion in your veggie broth, which is fine, because like maybe 90% of the stuff you're going to use, you want onion flavor in it. Um, But I would label it broth and maybe with onion or something. So you know. Um, And do date it. Not that it really goes bad, but I try to, you know, try to use them. Rotate your stock a little bit using your oldest stuff first. Just makes sense. And even if it gets a little freezer burn, doesn't matter. You're going to melt it. It's going to be fine. And this stuff is really especially good if you have someone who's on a low salt diet. And the stuff that you buy, the little cubes and, you know, even the soup base, oh my God, it's so full of salt. So when you first taste your veggie broth, you're going to be like, wow, this needs salt. So add a little salt into it, you know, but I would add it to taste after you've made it. So you're not like way over salted. 
But also be aware that a lot of recipes, when they call for veggie broth, they're assuming that you're using the salted variety. So when you taste it, you're going to have to add salt to that recipe because you know you didn't buy, you know, you didn't buy the cheap crap. You made your own, so you're going to need to add some salt. I find if I run out of broth, if I'm making something and I'm doing a lot of cooking and I use up all my broth and then I have to resort to the cubes, um, I don't add any other salt. And I'll try and do it like half and half, half mine and, you know, one little cube or something. And then I don't add any more salt because it totally has enough. And once you've eaten that way for a while, your taste buds will, you know, they'll adapt and you won't, you won't be adding like a ton of salt to your food anymore. Just a whole lot healthier for you. What are some of the other things you do with the broth? Well, I marinate in it, um, I saute in it, so like instead of using oil, you can use broth, you know, to, and you can cook anything in broth, you don't have to use oil, or sometimes wine. Wine adds a nice flavor, so sometimes I'll add a couple tablespoons of wine to the veggie broth, you know, if I'm um, sauteing vegetables, or, because I don't really fry anything anymore, unless I, if I have to, I use coconut oil, but a lot of times I'll use a veggie broth. Oh, thank you, that reminds me, something I almost forgot. I have like a couple of spare ice cube trays. So I measured the ice cube trays and it's like a tablespoon. So I put the broth in the ice cube tray, freeze it, and then pop it out and stick it in a bag or stick it in a jar. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so then I don't have to I don't have to like thaw a whole cup of broth if I'm only gonna use three tablespoons to stir fry some vegetables in. I'll pop three ice cube things out or I'll take them out of the bag, just stick them in there. And I used to do that with my coconut oil too. I would pop it into the ice the ice cube trays and because it doesn't really it gets really hard in the fridge but if you leave it out sometimes it, it doesn't go rancid as quickly as other oils but it'll go rancid it will and I use the oil so infrequently that you know I really I didn't want to throw it out so I freeze it in the ice cube trays too and then just pop it in a jar pop it in the fridge and it stays solid. Mm -hmm. um, which kind of pressure cooker do you guys recommend? The one that's like a machine that you can plug in or the one that goes on your stove top? Well, we have both. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? Uh, we go to those home things at, the, at the, the state fair and stuff and they have all those incredible booths with all these incredible vendors and, you know, like gadgets. So we have a pressure fryer that goes on the stove. We also have an instant pot that you plug in. We have a space limited kitchen, so if we had to just only have one, what would you recommend? Is um, there a problem with some pressure cookers on a glass top? Mm -mm. I don't know. Because I, I have a glass so, top. Like if you have a glass top, you're not supposed to use a pressure cooker. That, uh, no, I have a glass top. Okay. And I, I used to use my grandmother's pressure cooker on it too, and never had a problem. You have a glass top? Yeah. 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 Well, you might like the Instant Pot better because it, like, it's a pressure cooker. It's a... It also doubles as a crock pot. It also is a rice cooker, and it does like seven different functions. Mm -hmm. So we got it to kind of replace the other stuff, but then no, but we have a crock pot. Yeah. So we got it to replace the crock pot, replace the rice cooker, and you know, replace mm -hmm. the other pressure cooker, that kind of thing. We're you know we're really liking it, and it also it's electric, so it has a lot of settings, and you can you can press you know you can put it in for whatever the setting is, and it comes with a, a little cookbook, so it kind of walks you through different stuff. Um, the pressure fryer that we had, same kind of thing, but it goes on the stove. So it really kind of depends on what you're going to use it for. Investigate. Just don't get the old-fashioned kind that everybody's afraid of. Because I guess they used to blow up. I don't know. We, we've never had an issue. With I have one of the so. old-style kinds, I guess. Uh -huh. but it has three different pressure valves, so right. there's like almost no chance. Because if one of them were stuck, they still got two others. Yep. yep. So. And the old-style that I have also has the stove. little the little knob. So you, like, if you wanted it on five pounds, you put it on that side. If you wanted it on 10, and then if you want it on 15. And we, I used to use that. That's what we grew up using. So, you know, I didn't know they were dangerous until, you know, everybody was like, oh, my God, you use a pressure cooker. That's so dangerous. I'm like, really? And I'm a klutz, so if I didn't screw it up. <laughs> but also you make sure that your seals are, are nice. In Florida, especially because the rubber rots. It's, it gets hard or the sun hurts it, so you got to store it in a, inside the cupboard. is probably fine. I've had mine for years. But you can buy new seals online, too. You know, they have all kinds of parts. But I would say, you know, either either one you like, depending okay. on what you're going to use it for. And then really do explore them because they do, you know, you make your own hummus. They do, you make your own beans. I mean, buying them, and, and that's probably a whole other workshop. But, you know, buying the, the dried beans, and then you, you can soak them overnight, and then, Pop them in the pressure cooker, and in 20 minutes, you've got black beans and rice. 
and they taste so different. I mean, when my husband makes hummus, I can't even eat the store-bought stuff anymore. I just can't because it's just so much better. And he makes it with the, the little chickpeas he dries and he soaks them overnight and then pops them in the pressure cooker and then he puts them into the food processor and we add all kinds of whatever's in the fridge that's left over. <laughs> so there's green olives, there's Kalamata olives, you know, he'll do... He'll do a Greek theme, and he'll do all kinds of... He's made peanut butter hummus, and it was really... The kids loved it. Me, not so much. <laughs> he made sweet potato hummus last month. I mean, you know, you, but there's so many things you can... It just opens up a whole new avenue of, of cooking and exploration. Call me when you get one. <laughs> I'll start sending you a whole bunch of recipes and stuff. I read somebody describing this kind of shift as saying, if you could get down to... One can a day, and then get down to one can a week. Yeah, oh, and then cool. one can a month. Yeah, of, you know, canned soup, canned food, mm-hmm. basically. Because almost everything that we buy in canned food, we could cook. Oh yeah, food. oh yeah. It's just you know, it's the convenience, you know. And I think it started happening like, I guess during World War II, popular. and it, in the fifties, it was very, very popular. I mean, they even discouraged women from breastfeeding in the fifties because they were saying that you know formula was better for the baby, and it's like. Really? You can't improve on Mother Nature, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, now we strained out the scraps, and we've squished them, squished them, squished them. We got every last drop. We're all cleaned up from that. Now I want to talk about the compost bucket, okay? Everything that you eat that's vegetable matter can be composted and given back to the land. Every single thing. So your potato skins that you didn't put in the broth, they can go right into the compost bucket. The only thing that you don't want to compost is meat. Anything with meat, you don't want to compost. So if it's already, if it went rotten in your fridge, great. Throw it in the compost bucket. It's halfway there. (laughs) We also keep a separate one for coffee grounds and tea bags, um, only because we have roses and gardenias. And roses and gardenias specifically really are acid-loving plants. And if you look around, our soil is all shell. So it's all heavy, heavy alkaline. Now, up here, it might be a little more acid because you've got all these pine needles composting down nicely, so it really does balance out um, the levels. But down in South Florida, it's mostly sand and mostly shell. So you really need to add to your garden. If you're going to grow anything, you're going to need to add. We add the um, coffee grounds. We add the tea. And you can put it in a regular composting bucket, but we like to keep it separate because he wants to give a little extra. When the bucket gets full... He has these little compost areas. And you can go online and you can buy all kinds of expensive compost bins. It's not our way. We're going to spend our money on on the pressure cooker. (laughs) We're not going to spend our money on the the compost bins. What Rakit has developed is he just takes a five-gallon bucket and he cuts it in half. Okay, he cuts the bottom off of it and then he cuts it in half. And he sticks it in the ground, just right on top of the ground, right next to wherever the plants are, and the fruit trees, anything like that. We've got them all over the place. And so he takes the scraps, and he just pops it in, in the compost bucket. And then he puts cover over it. Okay, And you want to cover it because you, it want, it, you want it to be a little wet, but you don't want critters getting into it. You don't want it being rained on. Um, so you want to cover it. And it also it builds up heat in there because the composting builds up a lot of heat. And so that's good. So if you feel around the edges and it's a little warm, that's kind of good. If you see steam coming out of it, it's kind of even better. You know, it's doing its thing. After about six weeks, you take the cover off and you rake it out. And you're going to have, like, dust. You know, it's just going to have composted, like, pretty much down to nothing. And you just work that into the soil. And then if you want, you can start a new one right in that same spot. Or you can move maybe to another one. Um, The other thing that he uses, if you can find it, is um, construction waste. So, like... Sometimes you go and you've got like this big PVC pipe, you know, you'll see it in the trash. He takes the sawzall and he cuts it down to about nine inches high. And then he just, he uses like a stone patio thing or a tile or even a plastic cover to cover them with. And they're like all tucked away all over our yard, you know. And he keeps track of like which ones he's used last. But he'll just go and he'll just add he'll just add some to this one or add some to that one. He'll pop the cover off and see how it's doing. Stir it up a little bit sometimes. Put some more compost in there and close it up. And I have to say that I've been living in that house since 1987. And this is the other thing about you know if you're if you're in one area for a long time, you really have an ability to improve the land that you're living on. 
my yard would barely grow grass. Somebody had covered it in a bunch of gravel. We had to sift through all that crap. And now when you're using the compost also, you can't just use straight compost. You have to add at least, you know, 50 to 75% dirt to it. If you're using it just, you know, the plant in a pot, but you could use it for that too. My yard now will grow anything. Oh my God, anything. Anything you stick in the ground, it's going to grow. You know, he has like 99% success rate with his rootings and his growings and all that. And that's partly because of who he is, but it's also partly because of how he's been working this land and improving the land and composting everything on it for so many years. Just keep moving the spots around. Or if you don't want to move them around, you can take the stuff and just take a shovel full and put it where you need it. Um, you can also add leaves. You can add cut grass. Because composting, is, it's a combination of nitrogen and carbon. And it's not really as complicated as it sounds. And you can go online and, you know, you can find all these really scholarly um, works about composting. And there's even Composting 101 and Composting for Dummies and stuff like that. And that's where I usually get my information because it's, <laughs> it's down here where I'm at, not, you know, up here where he's at. So he's got all that. He's got the degree. He understands all that stuff. I'm just looking at it like, okay. So I just dump the bucket, right? That's all I need to know. <laughs> just dump it in the thing, put the cover on, walk away. I'm good with that because I'm good with anything that I don't have to sit there and fuss with. I want to be able to go and do something else. And it's really great. I mean, it works really, really good. The system I really like because, you know, you read organic mm -hmm. garden book or something, all compost. They have a giant in here. You have to turn it. And you give all those elaborate instructions. Right. And then once it's done, you then have to still move Carry it to where you want it. Yeah. Right. But composting in place is small things. You just layer it and you don't have to touch it. And exactly. You know, things. Exactly. And then you just rake it out or shovel it through. Right whatever. There. It's right there. So you put the plastic lid on. Do you actually snap it on or do you just lay it on? Well, he lays it on because we don't have raccoons. Okay. But if you have raccoons. Like, I'd be afraid it gets so hot it might. Nah. No? Okay. It, it doesn't. You know, okay. and we're, we're in South Florida. Right, so. Yeah, no, it doesn't. And I mean, sometimes I have walked by and I have seen like little whistles. It might actually improve it because it gets so hot. It does. Like a pressure cooker on this. Yeah, yeah, and it really cooks it down. Right. So you want it, Fast. like, it's funny because you want it to be kind of wet when it goes in. Right. And you don't want it too wet because you get torrential rains and you get too much. So. Right, and that's why you have to cover it. That's so um, But when it's in the bucket and the food is rotting in the bucket, it's, treating it's, it's already true. getting wet. It's mm -hmm. already sliming out. So when you, when you empty the bucket and it's full and you put it in, and we get, we have one of those stainless steel ones. Mm -hmm. Um, but you can use a, they have ceramic ones. If you don't like the smell when you open it, you know, just walk outside, open it, put your stuff in, close it, and bring it back in. Because when it's about three quarters full, it starts to have a bit of an odor when you open that top. We just keep it in the fridge. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll come with it every, you know. Yeah. Couple days, whatever, you have enough, you take it out. I have no one in my fridge. But she yeah, so. I'll come with it's been like a, a large one, and I was thinking, oh, maybe we should get the kind where you can turn it and stuff, but yeah. but you know what? Not worth it. If I have seeds of something, it's kind of funny. Um, I'll have like, I, I grew cucumbers and I used the seeds, threw it in there, avocado. Sometimes I open it up, I haven't gotten in there in a week or two when mm -hmm. I go to And some my, stuff sprouting. I got a, a Haas, I was telling him have a ha Haas avocado growing out of the seed. Yeah. It's this tall. Yeah. And I'm like, what is that thing in there? Yep. Or I'll harvest some plants that are growing out of my own. Um, All my best mango trees come right out of the compost. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. trees. Yeah, yeah. 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 but, but I'm trying to grow room. them on my own, like a, a, an avocado, and it's like uh -huh. sometimes it doesn't make it. Yeah, usually. It usually survives at some point. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't usually make it. The Haas avocados, I don't think, will grow here. That's why ours look like little footballs. Because they're a different okay. type. I've never yeah. tried to grow one. I mean, I know that's not native here. It's California, but... No, we have an avocado tree in our yard, but it doesn't give you those little guys. It gives, I mean, those. that's the size of the seed. No, my parents' <laughs> yes. house in Sunrise, they got avocados. That yeah. big is insane. Yeah. It's like a small watermelon. It's exactly. Like a yeah. I love it. It makes so much guacamole. Oh, my God. Do you take the staples out of the tea bags? No. I don't. In there too. Did yeah. you say I missed that? Did you say that? You, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, tea bag. Well, we usually take the tea bags in the coffee grounds, and we have them in a little separate container, only because we use them. We give the roses and the gardenias an, an extra dose because they really need the extra acidity, and uh, the rest of the plants need a little bit, so it evens it out for them. Before we end and uh, pass out some recipes, two more things I wanted to touch on: something that's called composting tea, and composting tea is any kind of animal poop from a vegetarian animal. So it can't be your cat or your dog because they have meat in their food. But you take, and I know this sounds gross, 
But if you have, you know, birds, rabbits, guinea pigs, anything like that, an animal that has that eats vegetables, take their animal poop, stick it in water, and let it set. Let it dissolve. Water your plants with that. They will love it. They will love it. Now, I know we're all at the cow stage. I don't have a <laughs> rabbit, but my daughter did. Or we'd have the rabbit to babysit, and they went away. We'd go up scooping up little rabbit pellets, and like he's making composting tea. We had birds, so we could use, you know, the bird stuff for the composting tea. The other thing is, um, ladies, if you're menstruating, or if you have daughters, or if you have other people who are menstruating, and I know this sounds gross, but make a tea out of it. Stick whatever you're using in a bucket of water outside. Just let it set for a little while, and then water your plants with it. Your plants will love you. Oh, my God, there's so much micronutrients in female blood. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, that's what they make blood meal out of. You know, they use cow's blood and stuff, and you have to pay for that, and you're getting it for free every month. Well, you're not now, but... <laughs> Eventually, it's us. Right, right. Right. <laughs> Eventually, but I mean, it is it is really super great stuff. And that used to be a third degree women's mystery. And now I'm sharing it with all of you. <laughs> but yeah, Mo, absolutely. Water your plants with it. Absolutely. My roses went wild. They so loved it. And I mean, and it's not overfeeding them because you're only getting it, you know, once a month, which is about how often you want to give them a little extra feeding anyway. So, I mean, the cycle is so natural and so great and it all links together. You know, it's just such a great system. So that's that's pretty much what I wanted to present today. Are there any other questions? I wanted to add, I don't know if you have read a book called The Human in Your Handbook. Mm -mm. I highly recommend it to everyone. It's free download. I mean, that human manure handbook. I think the guy's Human manure. Just called human manure. Human manure. Yeah. It sounds like it's something you would probably for want to <laughs> um, The other thing I would encourage everyone to do is dumpster dive. Um, crazy mm. quantity of ricotta cheese gets fed to my chickens. Yogurt, ice cream, yeah. whole pizzas. Um, it's amazing that a few you start throwing out at your local Windex. Mm. Oh, yeah. They have to throw it out. They have to throw it out. It's beyond the day. Really, they have to throw it out. I didn't really start cooking until I was in my 30s. Before then, I was just too harassed and harried. <laughs> Working full time and raising kids and everything. It was like, oh, it's time to do this. But then I was then I was really encouraged. you know. And it helps to have an appreciative audience. So if somebody cooks for you, I would say appreciate it. If, you, if they ask you to critique it, critique it. If you start making faces, it may be the last meal they cook for you. So, just saying. You don't have to have all kinds of exotic things. But I'm saying, if you know, if you buy spices and they say, you know, it expires in a year or whatever, it just means that it's not as potent. Add to taste. You know, if you add it and you go, wow, I can't really taste that. Dump in some more. All right, that's about all I have. Thank you so much. You are very welcome. <laughs> In our last segment of this episode, we'd like to thank you for listening. Putting a podcast together is a time-consuming labor of love, but knowing that someone is listening to our hard work and hopefully gaining something from it makes it worthwhile. Would you let us know you like the podcast? By going to our website at emlc.net, click on the podcast tab, and write a comment. Tell us what you like and what you'd like to hear more of on our podcast. And even better, why not leave us a rating on iTunes? Ratings help us become more visible to more people. It's not about ego, it's all about service. Thank you, and blessed be.
to love.